afternoon, everybody. I'm Carrie Weber, and I'm the executive director of the Fairfield University Art Museum in Fairfield, Connecticut, and it is my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I'm so pleased that the Greenwich Audubon Center has joined with the museum as a community partner to collaborate on a robust schedule of programming around our current exhibition, Birds of the Northeast, Gulls to Great Ox. I'm sorry that most of you won't be able to see this exhibition in person as the museum is closed to the public this spring because the campus is closed and the pandemic is uh, keeping it that way for now. But um, only students, faculty and, and staff can see the beautiful works in the exhibition at this time. But if that changes, we will certainly let you know as soon as possible. You can, however, experience the exhibition virtually through numerous access points. If you go to the exhibition webpage, um, which is easy to find, just Google Birds of the Northeast and Fairfield University, you'll find it. Um, you can find a 360 degree virtual tour, uh, which includes the wall labels. This is available in English and Spanish. Um, and you can find a really fabulous short film. It's about five or six minutes. It's, it, it just takes you through the whole exhibition beautifully. You can also find digital versions of the exhibition brochure and a field guide to the birds at Fairfield, which was created um, by um, Professor Todd Osier, who's a professor of ornithology at Fairfield. He um, put together the um, materials in this guide with his students over 10 years of research um, observing birds on the Fairfield University campus. And then on our YouTube channel, where this talk will, will make its way eventually, um, you will find recorded programs that have taken place um, since the exhibition opened in January. Um, those are also available with Spanish subtitles. These include a wonderful opening night talk by Dr. Brian Walker, who's a professor of biology and one of the co-curators of the exhibition. A talk on Marsden Hartley, uh, looking at him as a painter of birds. Uh, that was given by Dr. Jonathan Weinberg. And from earlier this week, a fantastic talk with Dr. Drew Lanham, a distinguished ornithologist from Clemson University on birding while black. Uh, the, the program that you're going to enjoy this afternoon, Observing Birds, Appearance, Sounds, and Behaviors, was created to complement a virtual program that we're presenting next week called How to Draw a Bird. Uh, Fairfield University Professor of Studio Art, Suzanne Shamlin, is uh, leading this workshop next Tuesday, March 9th at 5 p.m. I hope you will join us for that. Now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, pass this over to Ryan McLean, the Bird Education Specialist of the Greenwich Audubon Center, to educate us all on how to observe birds. Hi, Ryan. Hello, everyone, and thank you so, so much, Carrie, and to everyone at the Fairfield University Art Museum for um, this incredible opportunity to partner with all of you. And we are so thrilled to be part of an unbelievable series of events that the museum is hosting for these incredible pieces of work that are on display that you can view from the comfort of your own home. And um, we, there, we know that there are many wonderful events to come, which will include a couple more from us, which we will be telling you about in the weeks to come. So please um, visit their website, which is listed on the, um, on the description of our Facebook event page so that you can get an idea of what is coming up and how you can view this special, this special uh, opportunity to see some of these great pieces of work right here in the state of Connecticut. So as we, as we interact with art and we observe and experience art through our variety of senses and the way that we feel and emote, we also can do the same for birds. Birds are an artistic subject that has always captured our imaginations in a variety of different capacities. We admire them for their exquisite beauty. We admire them for the abilities that they have that we wish we could have. We all wish we could fly. We all wish we could sing with such exuberance like they can. But there's also ways of observing these creatures in our world that get into even more finer details and elements of their lives that we may not have thought about. We can often look at a bird and say, oh, that's beautiful, it's flying. But there's the questions that we can also ask. It's not just what does this bird look like, but what is this bird doing? 
Is it looking for food? Is it trying to attract mates? Is it trying to warn of danger? And how is this bird able to do what it does? These birds are built with their very own special adaptations and capacities to be able to carry out their lives and do the incredible feats that they are able to use to survive in nature. But we don't often know the fine details of how these birds have gotten to that point. So what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today in the time that we have are maybe some of the elements that we can all start looking at and listening for and feeling as we are out in nature and observing these birds. To start, just to show you some of the very fine details that you may not be able to see get up close in person as much, the anatomical structure of these birds is something that unless we see it from a very microscopic angle, we don't often realize how important of a part it is in birds' lives. With the birds being, with birds' flight, um, we are able to notice and witness how these birds are able to navigate through air, through the wind, but it's different elements of their parts of their body and their design that are, that are enabling them to do so. And the part of their body distinct to them, just to them and the dinosaurs that have come before them, are feathers. And we often think of feathers as the key element that separates birds from all other living creatures that happen to still exist on our planet. But looking at the feather as a brilliant piece of flight design is what is going to give us an idea of how these birds are able to live their lives. And thinking about the different parts of a bird's feather and the amount of feathers on a bird's body, which vary from species to species and that vary from one family to the next, tell us a lot about how each different family of birds is capable of flight and some of them may not be capable of flight. Now feathers serve multiple purposes besides flight themselves. With flight feathers, such as this feather of a hawk that you see me holding here, you see the main part of a feather where if I turn it on its side, you can see it almost acts as sort of a perfect airfoil to deflect wind off of the bird. And that is what the curved surface of the stem of the feather, which is made from keratin, same stuff our fingernails are made out of, is designed to do. But it's within that structure of the feather that it gets a lot more complex. Now, if I gently pull the piece there, you can see how easy it is for pieces of that feather to come undone. On that main stem that you're seeing of the feather, there are individual hair-like structures that come out, which are referred to as barbs. And if you looked at it even through a microscope, all of those barbs would have tiny little teeth on them that are called barbules. Now imagine a zipper like this one on me, how it zips up and down, closes up, provides some structure and provides a very locked mechanism. Imagine each one of those barbs and all the barbules as hundreds of individual little zippers on a bird. And imagine having to keep all of those zipped. That is exactly what the bird is going to need to do in order to most efficiently fly and to be able to survive when it's out in nature. So if we've ever observed a bird engaging the behavior that we know of as preening, because unlike one of us, which we can scratch ourselves or we can zip up our zipper with our hands, birds can't do that with their feet, so they will have to use their beak for it. So the behavior that we know as preening is in a sense, these birds zipping up each of these individual zippers, which to us, it may look like them just fluffing up their feathers, but no, there is a very important purpose to all of that. They have to make sure all of these are in line to be able to have that mechanism that will keep them able to fly. Like a jet engine plane or pilots and airport workers are gonna to need to ensure that every cylinder is in its right place in a jet engine to be able to safely lift off the ground and come back down to the ground again. So it's through that behavior of preening that they are able to zip up all of these individual zippers to be able to have that maximum amount of strength when they fly. At the base of these feathers, we see the more fluffy like structures of the down portion of the feather and that provides insulation. It traps the air into it so it can provide the bird with warmth, which birds even like a little chickadee will need at this time of year when it's still very cold outside and they are gonna need to maintain that body heat in order for them to survive in colder temperatures. 
But on top of those feathers, there are also certain other varieties of feathers that serve different purposes. Now, if you look right here in our specimen of one of our most elaborate native duck species, the wood duck, you can see that there's different colors on these feathers. Now, different colors, certain pigments, serve different purposes for different bird families. But by and large, a lot of the feathers that we see on the outside of birds, which we refer to as contour feathers, are what eventually gives that bird the shape that we are used to seeing in them. Whether it's an ornamental purpose, like the big plume or crest that a bird might have on the back of their heads, or more shingle-like structures on the bird's wings. Where on a bird like a duck, you can see it almost has a bit of a sheen to it as well. And that is so sometimes in some species that are prone to living in or around water, it needs to provide more waterproofing to those feathers. So that will help keep birds dry and not interfere with the overall structure of their feathers when they're maybe diving in water or surviving in the water. Some birds, however, have to trade one adaptation for another as far as their feather structure goes. Now you saw on the duck that I just showed you how it will have feathers that are able to be waterproof and have an oil-like sheen to them. But other feathers, like this one, may not be as waterproof. This is the feather of a great horned owl, where if you look at it closely, it may look somewhat similar to the hawk feather or perhaps this turkey vulture feather. But if I wave this hawk feather with some force, you can hear some air coming through it. You can hear some surface noise. Listen to the owl feather when I wave it. not much of anything. It's because on this feather, the frontal facing part of this feather, there is an extra soft layer of what is all natural soundproofing that provides an owl with the ability to fly silently at night so that its prey won't detect it coming. Because of that, it has that special adaptation to catch food, but owls are not very much waterproof. So if you ever see an owl stuck out in the rain, it looks very grumpy and I don't blame them. But it's been able to trade that adaptation for something that is giving it the ability to hunt in a very effective fashion. Some birds even have feathers that create noises, which will help in the bird's day-to-day -day life and certain important events that they have to go through each and every year. And one very special bird that we often celebrate this month as a harbinger of the return of spring is a small little plump grapefruit-like species of bird that will emerge here as soon as it starts to get warm again. And this is our American woodcock. It's a relative of the sandpipers and other members of the shorebird family with a long, very chopstick or tweezer-like bill, which serves as a big probe to dig into the ground and get earthworms. And you can tell that this is a ground-dwelling species because of that probe-like bill and the eyes that are positioned largely on the top of its head so that it could see a ground predator like a coyote or a fox coming from behind it. What's amazing about this species as well is that aside from their feathers and their very fluffed up plume-like tail, they actually have a special feather located on the very end of their wing, which is not just designed for flight, but also designed to make noise. The wind that comes through that one set of little feathers on the end of their wing will produce a twittering noise when the bird is in flight. And this is a species that is an artist in its own right because they are performers. And it's at this time of year that one of our most celebrated signs of spring is hearing the evening performance and seeing the display flight of the American woodcock. Where the males of this species will find a large opened area. Where they'll come out at the very last moments of light as the sun is setting, find a location where they're very easily exposed so that other woodcocks can see them, where they will then go into probably the most unelaborate and single one note song of the bird world. Very simple nasal call, the <coughs> They will do that one note call in succession for maybe a couple minutes or so, but it's at that point that these feathers are utilized because the bird will then go up into the air, start spiraling upwards to an excess of a few hundred feet, all the while hearing that twittering motion of their wings as they continue to climb 
spiral in a funnel-like tornado formation, and then eventually they will plummet and zigzag back down to earth, return to the same spot that they've landed at, and start the process over again. So that's something that we can not only observe that these birds are doing, but it's something that they will actually use to perform in order to appeal to other woodcocks. So this male, a male woodcock will be doing this performance um, to try to attract other female woodcocks at this time of year. Well, other birds will utilize song abilities. Other birds like eagles, which mate for life, will perform displays mutually where they will lock talons with one another. And it's those special elements of their design that we not only think about the precision and artistry that they are using, but we also think about the design of their wings overall. It's not just the feathers that help them fly, it's certain elements of their wing structure that help certain birds fly differently, such as our fastest animal on the earth, the peregrine falcon right here, which with their design of wings, they're quite literally like a fighter jet in shape. They have a pointed wing structure where a bird like a red-tailed hawk might have a rectangular wing structure, which gives them good surface area for soaring. But a peregrine falcon has that tip, that point to the wings, which helps it maneuver and catch its prey in midair, where this will help the bird dive at excesses of almost 200 miles an hour. It's been clocked. So in looking at different wing shapes, we're not only thinking of colors, and designs that we can see on a bird that's perched, but we're also thinking about what we're able to see when the bird is flying. Here at the Greenwich Audubon Center at our Quaker Ridge Hawk Watch, when we were observing migrating birds of prey in the fall, we're not seeing them perched in trees going from one tree to the other. We're seeing them at about a thousand feet up in the air as a small dark silhouette or a pepper speck. So then we're looking at them like letters of an alphabet, different shapes and designs, different structures and art forms that are able to tell us how they're living their lives. The bird's tail is also a steering wheel. Those feathers are designed so they can quickly maneuver one way or another. A bird like in our display case behind me, a Cooper's hawk, you can see behind me here, bird design that sometimes may even be at your bird feeders once in a while when it realizes there is a supply of food there, but cutting through trees with its long tail in pursuit of a small sparrow or other songbird is how that bird maneuvers and outmoves the other bird that it's also quick and trying to catch. So it's these elements of a bird's design and structure that will give us an idea of what is going to be, what we can observe and what we can learn about them at the same time. It's not just observing the colors or listening to their songs or knowing what environment they're in, but it's how they are designed to do it and how they are living their lives. Not only are they very efficient, at finding food for themselves, but they are also very efficient at house building. Bird nests have their own incredible artistry and meticulous design to them that birds have spent years perfecting. Some birds in itself are artists as well. Species of birds like the bowerbirds in Australia will actually use different items to place in the front of their burrows to be able to show off their different special artistic nature of their designs, even burrowing owls in different parts of the of the North America will utilize certain objects that they find. But a lot of species and what we're used to observing is seeing a certain structure that will have elements that create a very solidified and long lasting design. They are true architects. Now, if we see a very familiar looking robin nest, which we'll hopefully start to see them utilizing in the weeks and months ahead, if you look at the design that we normally see for a robin nest, like this one right here, you can see that these birds with a bowl or cup shaped nest that we're used to seeing need an anchor to design their nest on. You can see that this right here has several sticks underneath that are helping to prop up the twigs, grasses, and mud that the bird is going to need to find to put on top of it. Now, they don't just put a bunch of sticks together. Some birds do. Some birds can be very messy nest builders, maybe like wrens or perhaps our uh, invasive uh, introduced European house sparrows. But a lot of birds know that if they are going to ensure the survival of their young, they are going to need to spend a lot of time solidifying their structure. So the mud, in a sense, is very much like concrete. They have to first weave all of these sticks and twigs together like meticulous knots of shoelaces 
And then the mud serves as concrete or clay of sorts to solidify each piece together and to provide that long lasting structure that is not going to break unless there is extreme conditions. So these birds know what is going to have to be done to be able to ensure that their design is going to last and is not going to blow over. It's not just the cup-like designs that hang from those structures, but some birds will also want to ensure that not only they have a safe structure, but they have a structure that will completely hide themselves in. Birds like Orioles, which you see the orange one above me here, will not build a cup-like nest. They'll build a hanging basket nest that you can see right here, which is its own beautiful work of art. Because what they have done is taken grasses and small, very light twigs and leaves and intertwined them around tree branches to create a hanging object that the female Baltimore Oriole or other species of Oriole will be able to enclose herself inside in. And with how well they've been able to unify all of these different threads and strands together, that, that will ensure that this basket won't break or cave under pressure. They can't just have can't, they, they can't just have that structure and design that's going to prohibit them from doing so. So this will be able to entail that they will be able to be safe and secure inside this structure so that they'll be able to survive. And as you can see, what they have what's in here that you may find in some oil nest are some uh, man-made man-made pieces of objects like some string, some yarn. And so this is something that people will need to be really careful about when providing some nesting material because um, there was there are sometimes there's materials like very soft pieces of animal fur. Um, there's even our own hair some people can use. But we want to be sure if we're leaving our own hair for birds outside that we cut it into very small thin strands because we don't want the birds to get entangled in these objects. It can be very easy for them to get entangled in that, as well as objects such as fishing line. A lot of bird deaths happen because of entangled fishing line being used for nests. So it's something we all want to be very cautious of in nest structure. Aside from birds that build nests on a tree branch, we also have our cavity nesters, such as our eastern bluebirds. We are already starting to see returning, and some have even stayed the winter. But since they are naturally tree cavity nesters, it's a species that can go to artificial nest boxes that we provide for them. And their nests that they will build inside don't need to be as much of an interwoven structure, but more or less a very soft little pile of soft grasses that the eggs and the young will be able to be softly cushioned and warm against with the walls of these structures, providing them safety, security from the elements and from wind. Uh, please stay tuned to our, our website and our events pages because we will be offering hopefully some special programs themed around nest boxes and building nest boxes in the months to come. So aside from their nests and aside from their appearances, when we are outside, what we are often enthralled by is the musical and, and, and encapsulating elements of birds' songs. So although it is windy outside at the moment, what we are gonna do now is take you on a little brief tour outside so that you can see the dip, so we can listen for the different elements of bird song if we are able to hear them. So you can point out not only the different varieties of songs that can be heard, but the different kinds of vocalizations that they hear. So in one second, um, you will, we will switch over to being outside. Hello everyone. So now we've come out to the back patio of our Greenwich Audubon Center building, which for any of you who is interested in coming to visit, um, our center building is open to the public. Um, our center building is still closed, but our trails are open to the public seven days a week. So you're welcome to come here walking anytime from dawn to dusk. And as you look at the back of our building, we are located at very high elevation so that you can see that 
you get not only a great view, but with this elevation, you get views of treetops that birds will often like to inhabit. And with this elevation and these very apparent structures, birds will often use those as basically performance perches to sing from. Now we're still awaiting the days of spring where we're having more bird song in our area. But if you listen, even at this time of year, there are certain timbres and musical qualities of bird song notes that we can hear that will tell us not only if they are singing in order to attract mates or to say, this is my territory, but they are also utilizing call notes that can have maybe a sweet quality, very metallic quality, like a loud chip note of a cardinal perhaps, to tell us that there might be danger or to say to another invade intruder in their territory, this is my area and I don't want you here. So if you look in the back of our building, even though we don't hear very much bird song or activity at the moment, we see some of the habitats that not only as we observe birds, we look for those different elements of what they are doing, but certain places where we know we might find certain birds. If you look behind me here, you can see we have a large sugar maple tree that is very much covered in snags because some of that, some of that has been caused by the tree getting struck by lightning at different points over the years, also some elements of decay. It is in those snags though that a lot of beetles and boring insects are now utilizing that tree to be able to create a sustainable ecosystem of their own. And that is a food source for birds like woodpeckers who are able to drill into those trees to be able to get the food sources that they need. So whenever you see snags or structures like that on an old tree, which we think may not be serving much of a purpose anymore, we can think that is a location where we can look for woodpeckers and other species of birds that are being able to use tree cavities in order to ensure their survival. Now, it would be days like today, you can hear the wind whipping behind me now as this cold air blows in. I mentioned the feathers and the surface area that they have. You know, a bird like a turkey vulture, which I showed you the feather of, they not only will have a wing structure that incorporates their feathers as an airfoil, but they will actually position their wings in such a way to help deflect the wind, much like perhaps a certain type of plane or other flying device will have to move their wing structure up or down. A vulture will actually fold its wings up in a shallow V formation, which is called a dihedral. And that dihedral shape will actually help them to rock back and forth in the wind and then be able to navigate themselves a bit more stably, even in very high wind conditions. So it's something that they're able to utilize that is able to help them fly more efficiently. So because we have that structure that they'll be able to have, you can actually not only see how they're using it to fly, but you can actually use it to identify them where a hawk or an eagle will be holding its wings really flat. A vulture will be holding its wings up in a shallow V to be able to rock in the wind back and forth. So if you're seeing a flying bird, as opposed to one first, you can also use those elements of being able to observe how they're holding their wings. But as far as bird songs, what you're gonna start hearing at this time of year, especially in the early mornings, and as we are in the later part of the afternoon, we are not hearing as much bird song. But it's usually in the first light hours that we hear what we will oftentimes refer to as dawn chorus where those first elements of lights of day are starting to emerge and birds know that it's probably the safest time free of predators to be able to utilize their song of capabilities where for many bird species they have different elements of their lung structure and voice box structure that we don't have we have our own larynx but they have a special different device called a syrinx which unlike ours which is one tube theirs divides into two parts. So they can actually harmonize with themselves. Certain bird species, beautiful elaborate songs like wood thrushes are capable of singing maybe one or two notes at once. It's those times when they're firing on all cylinders and utilizing their entire element of their voice box system that they're usually attracting mates or on breeding territories, but it's other calls they're able to use with just one part of their voice box, which will, which will make up call notes and other elements of their voice that they're using. So when you hear something like a really loud metallic chip, 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 perhaps of a Northern Cardinal, then we're thinking about how the different structure is being used. Um, even small little 
chips with a different, more sweet quality. Chip, 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 chip. Something like a sparrow. You can also think of calls that birds will be making when they're in flight overhead. You can be hearing a series of notes sometimes. Sometimes one of those chip notes or a few, like. And for us as people learning these songs, one very easy element of remembering some of them is using mnemonics or sentences, phrases that we come up with that sound similar to the rhythm of the quality of those calls. What I just did, the amount of syllables to go downward as the flight call notes of the American goldfinch, a bright little yellow goldfinch species that we'll often see all throughout the year with this little black cap. And sometimes we'll use the phrase potato chip, potato chip, potato chip to describe that call. So it's coming up with different phrases to remember the rhythm and cadence of bird songs. This helps us to remember them and to remember why they're singing in the first place. A bird like a Carolina wren is a very bouncing, repetitive song. You can use the phrase tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle to describe. So it's those elements, there's rhythmic elements timbre elements, they're all different instruments of the orchestra that are able to constitute all those different levels of varieties and sounds of bird songs that we're able to hear in nature. Unfortunately, since it's quite windy outside and it's getting later in the day, we're not hearing much bird activity now, but in the early morning hours, especially as it gets warmer out and their food sources become more readily available, then these birds are going to start singing again. So we're going to take you all back inside now to start having some Q&A and to wrap up the program. All right, everyone. So outside, even though we weren't able to hear any bird songs with our very prevalent wind, what you can start thinking about whenever even you step outside into your backyard or your office space, your neighborhood, looking at what kind of habitats might be starting to attract certain kinds of birds. And then when you hear them, what's the, what's the quality of the song that you're hearing and what might that bird be trying to convey when they are calling? So it's through using those elements of utilizing observation skills through sight, wondering what is this bird doing through the sounds that they are using, whether it's territorial, whether it's courtship, even a very simple nasal call like the beep of an American woodcock can be utilized to help us remember what that bird is carrying out in its daily lives right now, or what kind of call it's make, making when it's flying overhead and the places that they might be able to live as well. So it's all of these elements together that they are using to fulfill their role in our ecosystems and to be a part of the entire ecosystem as a whole, and to be able to utilize them and continue to strengthen them as they live their lives. And so these are just a few of the simple ideas that even if you're just, even if you're just wanna watch birds for the sake of enjoying all this summer, so um, what, what they're able to do in nature is something that encapsulates our imagination as artists and helps us to question as scientists as well. And the great thing is you can do both. You can be able to understand what the bird is doing, but also have them as a subject of our own imaginations to continue utilizing, to share with others as some of these wonderful um, displayed presentations that are part of the Fairfield University's exhibit right now are doing because through time, bird art has changed, evolved. We've seen it in our field guides um, and we've seen it in other elements of birds conveyed through art and through music, through dance. As I mentioned with some birds being dancers themselves that it's been an inspiration to all different elements of how we express ourselves and others. So I'm happy to take a few questions if anyone has for them. Um, we had some, one person asked, um, that um, they lost a couple of chickens last summer and we're sorry to hear that. Um, they're wondering if it was a Cooper's hawk, perhaps. 
Yeah, a chicken is a very large prey item for a Cooper's hawk. Um, so while it may be an extremely hungry young bird, I think the more likely culprit um, that would uh, be that would be large enough to take a chicken is a red-tailed cock, red-tailed hawk. But red-tailed hawks are very often mammal eaters, and for a hawk to take a chicken, they have to be relatively inexperienced at catching the food they're going to want to catch. So I would imagine that it was probably a young bird that took that that happened to. And so um, unfortunately, while we're sorry to hear that that happened, it is something that very seldom happens. And we and just having chicken wire around around these birds is something that's very easy to prevent them. So it's something that you know it's certainly uh, something to keep an eye on, but it's also something that you know doesn't happen as prevalently, uh, especially with more experienced birds. Another question, um, just a reminder of what the bird was that used the potato chip call. That was the American goldfinch that you, utilizes that. If you have bird feeders up, they absolutely love thistle seed. Um, so, and they will continue to eat that even into the summer months. So if you keep your feed, if you, if you keep your thistle feeder up, those birds will continue to come to that feeder. And so I'm happy to take any other questions that might come in. Um, And I will also mention that um, when I was mentioning the American woodcocks before, um, we have to stay tuned because we have some very special announcements coming up on uh, programs involving that species. We've got a call about do red winged blackbirds have different calls for mating and territory warnings? You are absolutely right. Yes, they do. Um, oftentimes, you will hear, and I actually I was very excited for the uh, couple of days ago when I heard my very first red winged blackbirds singing um, with their very guttural conquering vocalization that they use. So the males will puff up their bright red epaulets on the sides of their wings um, in order to display. But oftentimes when you have a very territorial male red winged blackbird on territory, you'll just hear chip notes or it's those abrupt calls that you'll often hear that will signal that there's some that the bird is trying to flush you away from something. Another question um, that you've been trying to get bluebirds to nest in your boxes for 37 years, um, but um, sparrows have taken over. Um, thank you so much for asking that. And that is unfortunately a, a problem that is very prevalent in uh, artificial nest boxes, which is um, um, predation by invasive house sparrow which is a species of bird that um, humans introduced from Europe that has a dark throat. Um, we're often used to seeing them in earth, suburban areas. And um, that's, they can also be extremely violent to our native bird species. So one thing you can do to um, help to deter them is it has been shown that if you hang bright metallic string-like objects from either side of your nest boxes, that can often deter them. So you can try that, or as I showed you in this bluebird box here, how simple and small of a design bluebirds use. If you look in your nest box and you see just this little structure of twigs, then you will most, and thin grasses, you most likely have a bluebird. But if you see a lot of stuff piled all the way up to the brim of the house, then it's usually house sparrows. If you see that, then you can evict all of that material and house sparrows, since they are introduced, they are not protected by law, so you can remove their nests. Um, we have all of these specimens and feathers and nests here because we have special licenses from the state and federal government in order to possess different parts of birds because all bird species in North America that are native are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of North America. So it is illegal to kill or hurt or have any piece of a bird unless you have those licenses. But the house sparrow, since they're non-native, you can evict their nests. And usually, even if they rebuild again, if they get evicted enough times, they may just move on and try to go to another location. Um, someone else asked, if should you fill your feeders in the summer? Um, as I mentioned, um, goldfinches are a species you can keep feeding into the summer with some regularity. They love thistle seed. You put up a thistle feeder with thistle or niger seed. It looks like chocolate sprinkles. It's really thin and their little beaks can open it. That's one source of food you can provide. Hummingbird feeders are a great option to have up in the summer months. Simple 
ratio of one part sugar to four parts water that you can make for hummingbird nectar. It's put in a hummingbird feeder. You don't have to buy any kind of food for it. We, also, we actually discourage, strongly discourage purchasing any artificial hummingbird foods, over-the-counter hummingbird foods, or putting any sort of red coloring in the food as it has been shown to have a neg negative impact on the bird's health. And a couple of people did ask um, what the best weather is for hearing woodcocks. Um, and I have actually already heard a couple out on our Hawk Watch lawn area. Even though it's gonna be a bit chilly the next few days, Usually on relatively warmer nights at the beginning of spring with maybe 40 degrees or so or above, that's when we're gonna to start to hear them with a lot more readily calling. Uh, so once this snow melts and more of them are starting to return to the area, those next few warmer nights um, from about now, even through the end of April, is when you're gonna to wanna to start listening. So those warmer evenings, usually right after sunset. And we're excited to say that stay tuned for an announcement soon and more details, but um, we will be having a couple of in-person Woodcock watches from here um, that'll be at the end of March. Um, it'll be limited to 15 people each, but something that uh, keep an eye out on our events calendar for because we will be announcing those soon for people to register, which we're very excited for because aside from private programs, these will be our first public in public in-person programs since last year, which we are greatly looking forward to. Um, and um, I'll be able to answer a couple more questions, um, but for anyone else, um, we're happy to answer more questions as replies on Facebook. I'm asking, um, how soon should we hang hummingbird feeders? Right now, our ruby-throated hummingbirds are spending the winter months still in Costa Rica, but they're going to be starting to make their way back across the Gulf of Mexico to be here around the beginning of May. So usually, I would say probably May 1st, start getting those hummingbird feeders out and ready to go. And one other person asked, um, if you, we've left sterilized eggshells out for bluebirds and they take them regularly. Is this helpful? Um, I wouldn't say it's harmful, but it's something that you don't necessarily have to keep doing because you usually they will be able to find um, certain materials, especially in those thin and soft grasses that are going to be able to provide that material that they need for their nesting. So I wouldn't say it is harmful, but it's something that if you want to try to keep doing it, you're welcome to, but um, it's something that um, will usually maybe be a supplement to what they're already putting in their nests. So um, once again, I do want to thank the uh, Fairfield University Art Museum to Carrie and everyone for um, being able to partner with us. And we're so glad to partner with you all for this special series of programs. And Carrie, I would, if you have anything else to address and anything else you'd like to tell everyone watching, um, please feel free to. Thank you. This was such a great talk, Ryan. Thank you so much. Um, I loved seeing especially your stuffed wood duck. We have a beautiful painting of a wood duck by Connecticut artist, James Prosek in our exhibition. Um, just the, the plumage is just so spectacular. And then um, talking about red-winged blackbirds, we have two really fabulous artworks of red-winged blackbirds um, that uh, I, I encourage everyone to check out. Um, I wanna thank everyone for tuning in and, and thank you, Ryan and uh, Greenwich Audubon for this collaboration. It was really great. I wanna remind people if you wanna learn more about the Birds of the Northeast exhibition to um, check the museum webpage and you will find lots and lots of information. And I wanted to just take a minute to highlight some of the upcoming programs uh, such as this, all related to the exhibition and or to birds. Um, all related to birds um, that might interest you. If you weren't here at the very beginning, I wanna remind you we have a drawing workshop, how to draw a bird on March 9th. And then on March 13th, we have a family day program, virtual. All of these programs are virtual, so you can enjoy them all from your home. Um, the family day program is all about birds. Uh, it's geared for children four to 10. On March 23rd, we have um, Dr. Douglas Talame who's a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware coming to talk about nature's best hope, which is the title of his best-selling book about a new approach to conservation, which starts in your backyard. Homeowners everywhere, and I'm sure many of you know this, but for those of you who don't, you can turn your yards into conservation corridors that will provide wildlife habitats. 
um, and he'll give you information that's practical and effective and easy and you can walk away with specific suggestions to incorporate into your own yard. And then um, April 14th, um, we have a terrific talk um, by Roberta Olson, who's a curator at the New York Historical Society. If any of you were fortunate enough to see any of the Audubon exhibitions that the New York Historical Society has done over the years, it was Roberta Olson who put those together. And she's gonna do a talk on John James Audubon, uh, uh, artist, naturalist, and early conservationist. And then we're gonna do one more program with Greenwich Audubon. So that date will be announced soon, mid-April. Ryan's gonna to come to campus and um, film around a, an, a part of the exhibition that is actually on the lawn of our library. We have five monumental sculptures by artist Todd McGrain called the Lost Bird Project. And so that program will focus on the extinct birds that are in our exhibition. Um, and uh, you can find all the information about these programs on our website, on the museum's Eventbrite site, and uh, registration is optional. We do love people to register so we know who's enjoying our programs, but you do not need to. All of the programs I described, with the exception of Greenwich Audubon, um, will be streamed virtually uh, through our uh, partnership with our Performing Arts Center, the Quick Center for the Performing Arts. It's called thequicklive.com, and you just go there at the time of the program and watch it watch it live there. So thank you. Uh, this was great. And I hope to see you all at future programs. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so yes, we are very excited to have to take a tour um, of this special exhibit of the Lost Birds by Todd McGrain uh, for our next program. This is a precursor for that. And we'll be talking about, you can actually see behind me one of the birds in this display case that I'm pointing at right here, that very streaked um, chicken like bird is a heath hen which is one of the birds um, that um, one of Todd's sculptures is of, of a bird that was common in our area just a couple of centuries ago. Um, but unfortunately, due to a variety of issues um, and um, habitat loss, overhunting, um, these birds have disappeared from our region. And even in Greenwich and in Fairfield County, these birds used to be extremely common. Early property deeds in the 1730s, three of those from the town of Greenwich described hen fields. So these were, that referred to heath hens, uh, these birds that used to be common in our area, but have sadly disappeared from our planet forever. So it's a reminder of what we can still do to help conserve these birds. And your support of these wonderful exhibitions and of conservation organizations like Audubon is continuing to help us to help birds. So if anyone wants to support Audubon and support the Fairfield University and support conservation work, um, we have a link in the chat box um, to donations for Audubon to continue to help support birds and provide education programs like this one. And you can also sign up for emails to learn more about programs that we are doing and other collaborations such as this one. And um, we are also offering private virtual and in-person programs still available if you want to continue learning more about birds and want to do a private social distance program for your family um, outdoors. And we are providing that option to come see birds in the wild. As we mentioned, you can come visit us here on our trails, even though our buildings are still closed to observe and watch birds. Um, so once again, um, thank you guys so much um, to everyone at the Fairfield University Art Museum and what an incredible um, great amount of programs that you've done so far and other programs that you have coming up um, with Doug Tallamy, who's a good friend of ours, um, a program on John James Audubon. Um, you just had a great, wonderful program with a fantastic Dr. J. Drew Lanham. Uh, we encourage actually people um, and anyone who was interested, um, uh, Dr. Drew Lanham just uh, published an article on Audubon's website that we certainly encourage people to check out called What Do We Do About John James Audubon um, that really um, goes into detail about, um, even though this is um, an individual who has made a huge mark on conservation, there are troubling elements of his past too. Uh, how do we address those and how do we move forward to create an inclusive environment for all to protect birds and wildlife? So um, we can post a link for that as well for you all to read. And um, once again, please go visit the Fairfield University Art Museum's website to see this full listing of events that they're offering, which we are so, so thrilled to be part of. So thank you all so much once again. Thank you, Carrie, and everyone. My pleasure. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful collaboration. Thanks a lot.